Excerpts have been taken from an interview with George Baxter conducted by Diana Terry of the Bunbury Oral History Group in October 1988 at George's home in Bunbury. Alan George Baxter, known as George, was a well-known Bunbury identity, being the town's tourism officer from 1966 to 1981. He was president of the Bunbury Historical Society, a councillor, and saved King Cottage from demolition to become a museum. He also helped refurbish the steam train Lushnaught Lady to be a tourism drawcard for Bunbury. What may not be so well known was that George spent four years in a German prisoner of war camp. This is just part of his story in his own words. George was a warrant officer with the two Second Field Park Company, an engineer unit, part of the 6th Division of the Australian Imperial Force, who left Australia on September the 22nd, 1940. He saw active duty in North Africa, where he laid and disarmed landmines. The unit was buoyed by success in Tripoli and Bardia and was sent to Greece in early April 1941 to stop the Germans advancing down the Greek peninsula. George's unit travelled as far as Lamia when word got through that they had to retreat due to the onslaught being faced further north. We pick up the interview where George is at Lamia railway station standing by a train. We were in this olive grove uh, and we were told to move down to the railway station. We no sooner got to the station and then there's this terrific bombing on the Olive Grove. We always reckoned there was Fifth Column that caused that. While we're there, they dropped two, a, a reconnaissance plane came over and dropped two bombs. They missed the station and missed us, made two big holes in the ground where the bombs had landed over from the railway station and then the next thing there's more German planes over and they landed their bombs right on us and that's where I got the wound in my leg. Corporal Ford, uh, Basher we used to call him, Basher Ford, he was killed right alongside me, almost as close as you are now. Uh, he was standing up on the platform and I just had time, I could hear the bomb coming down, I just had time to sort of dive between the tender of the, I think they were going for the engine, because we were right up near the front of the train. I was standing between the tender, uh, uh, rather just near the tender. I dived between the wheels of the tender and the little low platform only, which was only about a foot or 18 inches high. The When the bomb fell behind me, it killed Corporal Ford and one of the splinters came up from behind and it entered my leg there and went right up to about there. I've got a scar still to this day about, about that long. Knee, knee from from above the knee yes. fortunately. Mm. And it evidently travelled along through the muscle. It didn't get to the bone. It travelled along through the muscle but uh, it, it, it broke all the muscle away you see. And of course I was burnt, bleeding pretty profusely. And Phil Jackson, who lives in Whitnam Street in Bunbury, who was also in our unit, he came over with his um, field dressing and bandaged my leg up, I can remember that. By this time I was pretty groggy. I was taken on, uh, there's an Air, Air Force tender turned up with some other wounded on it, but with no aeroplane on it or anything, just, just the tender that had carried the planes up, I suppose. They put us on that and took us to Glafada, where the ho British hospital was. At Glafada, they operated on my leg. While we were there, we were in tents round the hospital because the hospital was full. And I, I'll always, as long as I remember those nurses, how wonderful they were. They put on their steel helmets, but they were still in the, and they were just carefully going round. And those that were, but shell-shocked, you know, pacifying them and keeping them quiet. The bombs were falling all around, although there was red crosses out on the tents, only just over from us was an ammunition dump, but we only found this out later.
they then moved us down to the docks in Piraeus Harbour. And I remember laying on the stretcher, you the same old procedure, the German reconnaissance plane came over and stooged around for a while and then the next thing afterwards we found out there were 28 of them, 28 German Stukas came over and had a go at the ship that they'd loaded me onto. Now I was very lucky that I'd been loaded onto the top deck but they had been loading wounded into the holds for at least a couple of days before. On this ship there were also women and children, refugees, it was not a hospital ship, it wasn't a very big ship, uh, it was the King of Greece's yacht which he'd handed over to the Allies for transport between Greece and Egypt. It had already done a trip to Egypt and the bows of her were all, was loaded up with ammunition that had never been unloaded. Well, after they got me off the dock, they took me up to the top deck. As I mentioned, I saw this um, individual reconnaissance plane come over and then this big crowd of Germans, uh, plop flyers with their Stukas. Uh, they really started a bomb, one after the other. And of course, where it's very impressive not only does the bomb make a screaming sound, but the Stuka itself has screamers on it. The noise is tremendous. It's, it's a sort of a demoralising thing, you see. Well, they, the bombs were coming down and I thought, well, it's no good getting into the water while, because by this time the ships are starting to get on fire with the bombing. The, the bombs are going not only one bomb I believe went right down the funnel, other bombs landed that went right down into the holes where all these wounded were. Uh, by the time the bombing stopped, all that area that was in the sort of structure where the people were on the top deck, I was laying out in the open deck, but you could look through to the sort of in part, because I'm sure that part of the structure is blasted away, you can see all these poor people in this terrible raging fire. I waited until the bombing finished and then I crawled to the side of the ship because my leg was paralysed, you see. I'd had the operations to get the shrapnel out I, before that when I was in the hospital. I got to the side of the ship and heaved myself into the water. It was a fair drop, I suppose about 20 odd feet or more into the water, swam along trailing my bad leg, but it, was, it wasn't too bad because I could use my arms and my other leg. The ship itself was moored to a barge which in turn was moored to the dock. So where I threw myself in was between the ship and the docks, you see. Well, I swam up and then there was another barge and swimming just ahead of me was another chap that had got off the ship. And I, I can still remember there, were, there was a British officer and two... Tommies ran, ran out onto the other d barge and they threw a rope to this fellow that was ahead of me and I can still remember me, I called out, wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> they did. I wrapped my hands around the rope because I couldn't possibly climb up the rope with this bad leg. All my bandage by this, bandages and everything had been washed off me by this time. Uh, because my trousers had been cut off previously, I only had pyjama trousers on and it all got washed away. They hoisted me up and then they loaded me onto a fire tender and I'm sure that there were people underneath me. Well, then they took me to a Greek underground first aid station that was right near the docks because they'd had a lot of bombing there from days before this. There I saw some terrible things, you know, with people injured women, children, a whole lot. Uh, they didn't do much other than bandage my leg up then and took me then to a Greek hospital in a... Uh, which was in a converted hotel. It was there that the Germans, while I was lying in bed, was an Austrian actually and there were only a lot, a lot of Austrians in that particular section that took over that part of the, of the city 
well, it was not the city itself, it was an area between uh, Piraeus and Athens, and the building we were in was about a four or five storey, uh, what had been a borstal, you know, a, um, a reformatory. But they used all the beds as hospital beds, you see. Can you remember the date of that? The bombing was on the 27th. Of what? April. 1941. And where did they take you then? They then took me to this fifth Australian General Hospital. From there I was there for three months. Then when I could walk around on a stick with others, I was taken from the hospital and put on a tramp st ship, a Greek tramp steamer, in the Piraeus Harbour. The that ship took us then to Salonika. On the way up, there was one night, and of course we were all down in the holds. There was one night they stood just about stood that ship up on its tail because we heard afterwards that it was being chased by a British submarine, or, or that there was a British submarine in the vicinity anyway. The only, in these holes, we lived on just tomatoes and a bit of, bit of bread, stale bread for the time we were in that hole, those holes. It was several nights, I remember. And it, it's a nasty sensation we're in the hull of the ship, and because it was so old, and the conversation, con condensation, from the men and the dampness, you could almost see the walls glistening and knowing that just out there, there might be a torpedo. Uh, they took us then to Salonika, where there was very bad conditions in the barracks. Only just before we got there, some Britishers had tried to escape and the Germans had shot them in the sewer pipe and left the bodies there as a deterrent to others not to try it. I remember in the barracks, uh, it weren't too bad in the daytime, but at night, what used to happen, the bugs used to crawl around onto the ceiling and then they'd parachute at night onto you. And, uh, we were all red, red raw with bite, bug bites and there was a certain amount of lice there too. And in, in Salonika, yes. and then the next thing, we were marched through the streets uh, I saw a German soldier there because an old woman came out and tried to give one of the prisoners a piece of bread. The German up with his rifle and put the butt straight into her face. You know, they did some horrible things, some of them, and yet yeah, some of them were very good fellows. We tried to outwit them where we could. I have conducted acts of sabotage. I'd have been shot for it if they'd caught me. In, in the main, you did it when you made, you see, that was something that you always did. You made sure you didn't get caught. And of course, being young, and probably full of devil, but you like to see, I remember once when, at a factory where we were working, that was at the paper factory later on, where a woman, a German woman, got her fingers caught in one of the machines. And the blacks made it a good excuse to wreck the machine to get around. The Germans couldn't say much, could they? That was the sort of thing, you know, they're always waiting for some opportunity. We filled axle boxes of trucks with stones and rubbish to get them hot boxes, and, you know, so that the trucks hold up on the main line. And The one they took us to first, and was probably the biggest British camp, was Lumsdorf, Stalag 8B, which later they renumbered 344. From there, with Dick Holmes from New South Wales, I made an escape. Uh, not from the Lambsdorff itself, but from a place called Salbsdorf, near Sandhebel. We got away from there, lasted a week, very amateuristic attempt. Uh, then, with Dave Anderson, I made another break, an attempt to get away from a place called Freiheit in Sudetenland, another working party, because it was easier to get away from a working party than it was from the main camp with all its watchtowers and um, the three metre high fences with tangled wire in the centre. Main camps I was in ever were Lambsdorff, three, uh, which at that time at the end was 344, having been 8B, 
then 8C, which was up at Sargon, right next to the uh, Air Force camp where the wooden horse took place. Uh, there's a picture of that in there that one of the chaps did, did for me, but left out everything except the barbed wire. He left out, or rather left out, put in everything except the barbed wire because he was so sick of He even put in the watchtower, but so sick of looking at barbed wire. And then the um, next one... Uh, after 8C was, no, I beg your pardon, I'm getting a bit out of order. Lambsdorff, after the second break, uh, 13C, Weiden, where I got right across Czechoslovakia and was caught again in West, what is now West Germany, because we were mainly in East Germany, what is now East Germany, Prussia. 9B Bard Orb. They were the four or five main camps that I was in that were usually taken to. That last one on Bard Orb was after they marched us just about 600 kilometres on foot with very little to eat, sometimes anything up to three or four days with nothing because their excuse was that everything was being so bombed at that time that they just couldn't get the food through to us. And it was there that the American tanks rolled up the hill and in true American style, they didn't wait for any gates open or anything, they just crashed through the barbed wire. And as it happened, they went into the uh, American compound first before they came... This was to liberate you? To liberate us, yes. Right. Uh, and they, when they ran into these tanks into the American compound, it wa with all the Americans in there, the Americans, after being prisoner, were so pleased to see them, everything that was removable on the tanks was grabbed by the XPA, the prisoners as souvenirs. <laughs> no, terrific people, the Americans. Uh, well, then from there, from Bud Orb, after the Americans released us, we were then shipped by them in motor trucks. I was in a very bad way at this stage, I might say, because the dysentery I contracted on the long march. I was in the what they called the Russian lazarette at the time when the Americans released me and others. Why were you on the march? Where were you going? Oh, they were marching us away from the Russians. Actually, when we left Sagan, we could hear the Russian guns for the full length of the horizon. They were about, and they were still 70 kilometres away, so the Germans said. All well, the Germans were panicking by this time because on that long march, uh, I've got the records here because at this stage I'd been made camp leader of that British, British camp and uh, I recorded the deaths that took part, took place, I should say, on that march. We passed at least three Russian corpses in the show, in the snow because with a Britisher they might do something with him, take him away somewhere if there was a hospital nearby or what they did with him we didn't, we never knew. They might have been lucky and got clear or they might have been murdered, we, don't, we never know. But the Russians, they just shot them off hand through the back of the head. If they were too exhausted to carry on, they just shot them. How many of you would have been on that march, roughly? Oh, there was a column of Russians ahead of us. How many was that? I don't know. But I think on our particular section there would have been about anything between 600 and 1,000, of which was the camp that I had been camp leader. And where were they taking you to? Well, we never knew from place to place till we got to um, um, Badal. When you made your escapes, were you punished for your efforts? Uh, yes, the first time uh, we were, um, I'm pretty sure Dick and I spent some time in the, in the bunker. I can't remember that with much detail because we're not very little difference to being in the normal camp. They just locked you up, that's all. It's solitary. I think we did uh, solitary there. The first escape. The second escape, I was in the bunker in 13C and the bunker there was just a big building separate from the other camp. What your life was like? 
the monotony the yes. monotony and the lack of food was the worst and the lack of, the lack of social contact being penned down all the time I studied in them I did my equi the equivalent to uh, intermediate accountancy uh, I started to learn a bit of German but I got sick of it because you're hearing it all the time it would have been better if I'd learnt more of it right from the beginning uh, because it would have helped better on the escapes uh, the lack of mail and knowledge of what was going on at home and of course uh, it was on that first break with Dick that we'd heard of the bombing of Darwin because the Germans made big thing of these things although it was Japanese action uh, the Germans did a lot of uh, things in, in the way of propaganda we heard the firing stopped to a degree on the night of the 1st of April, April Fool's Day of all days, and on the 2nd of April... Of what the year? 1945. Goodness. Mm. But I don't mind admitting when we came under that Sydney Harbour Bridge, which I'd seen before through being over there on my training, I had tears in my eyes. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I never forget it.